Hello, friends. Bless your hearts. We're going to sing again the theme song with Brother Leonard Moore. If Dear Lord, just make me a nail, just a nail on the wall, fastened securely in its place. Then from this thing so common and so small, hang a bright picture of thy face, and we thank you in Jesus' name, amen. Righteousness by faith, what is it? What does it have to do with God's holy Sabbath day? And what part does the holy Sabbath day philosophy have to do with righteousness by faith? Friends, I believe with all my heart that Jesus is coming again. I believe he's coming soon. How many agree? Will you say amen? amen. He's coming soon. I think of the years that have come and gone. I think of the signs of his coming that we've observed through the decades. Why, my friends, it's as though eternity now stretches before us. And how I pray for the Holy Spirit, how I pray for wisdom, that men and women, boys and girls, who come into a meeting like this will never walk out without knowing that Jesus Christ is your personal Savior from every besetment, particularly those besetments that are in the last days, capturing men and women all over the place. And so will you all be praying for the Holy Spirit as I speak? It is the Holy Spirit that delivers men and women, who transforms men and women. It is the Holy Spirit who uplifts Jesus Christ, who says to the heart, you can, by his grace, gain the victory over every besetment. You can be ready to meet Jesus Christ when he comes again. How? Righteousness by faith, that's how. In the fourth chapter of the book of Hebrews, the Apostle Paul deals with a Sabbath philosophy. He deals with the mighty power of the Word of God. He deals with a part of faith. And he deals with how we can rest back in his promises. In Hebrews 4.10 he said, He that hath ceased from his own works as God did from his. He that has ceased from his own works, he hath entered into his rest. He has entered into his rest as God did from his, who has done what? Ceased from his own works. How do we enter into this rest of victory? He has entered into his rest who has ceased from his own works. It doesn't mean that there's no labor because the next verse, the 11th verse says, let us therefore labor to enter into that rest. 1 Peter 6, 12 says, fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold of eternal life. It is there as a free gift. Victory is a free gift. We cannot work ourselves into it, but we can labor against all of the devil's accusations and doubts and circumstances. And the devil says, it's not a free gift. The devil says, look at all the mistakes you've made. He said, look, fight the good fight of faith. Know that Jesus Christ purchased your eternal life 2,000 years ago on Calvary. He purchased your victory 2,000 years ago. They are free gifts from his hand. You reach up in faith. You'll have to fight the fight of faith, 
Your heart will listen to the devil's accusings, for he's the accuser of our brethren. But don't listen. Fight to, to refuse to hear his accusations and hear the voice of Jesus saying, if you would enter into my rest, you'll cease from your own works as God did from his. I want to share with you not a lot of philosophy this morning, but a lot of practicality as how every one of us may enter into that rest by reaching up in simple faith and taking hold of Christ's right doing. For righteousness means right doing. And we can take hold of his right doing, both in his life 2,000 years ago and in his life in us today. First of all is the story of a Mr. Whitehead. Mr. Whitehead had just learned about the seventh day being the Sabbath. He had also lost his home. His wife had left him. He was also engaged in some habits that he didn't like. Like the Apostle Paul, he was saying, Oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me? And then he came in contact with Pastor Wise, I shall call him. Pastor Wise had just been at one of our camp meetings. His wife had had really been challenged by Satan, oppressed by the devil. She had a very serious illness. And through his reaching up and taking hold of the simple promises of God, asking, believing, and claiming, his wife was completely healed. Oh, we were so happy to rejoice with him. So when Mr. Whitehead met this pastor and said, I'd like to know a little bit more about this Sabbath and my home is in trouble and I'm having some habits that are horrible, Pastor Wise said, this is how you receive deliverance. This is how you keep the Sabbath, by faith. Mr. Whitehead said, what do you mean by faith? He said, all you have to do is to take God's promise, believe it in childlike simplicity, and go to your employer and announce that you've learned the seventh day is the Sabbath and you have to keep it. God will take care of the works. He said, but, but I feel like there's something I have to do. Yes, there is something you have to do. You have to decide that you'll take God's word. You have to reach up and take it in simple faith. You do have to do something, but your something is fighting the good fight of faith. So they knelt down and they claimed the promise. I believe it was Matthew 6, 33. Seek you first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Everything else will be added. The pastor said, now you can go to your boss. Just tell him that you can't work on the Sabbath anymore. Leave all the rest to God. He'll do the works. You'll reach up by faith and take it. So very tremblingly, he walked into his boss's office the next morning, and I guess he kind of got his tongue twisted around his eye tooth till he could hardly see what he's going to say. And he said, I've just learned the seventh day is the Sabbath, the Christian Sabbath, and I can't work anymore on the Sabbath. And his boss thought that he was saying, I'm going to quit you. The boss said, but stay with us. We need you. We said, I'd like to stay with you. But he said, I can't work anymore on the Sabbath. The boss said, I'll give you the next Sabbath off. He said, I don't mean that, sir. Every Sabbath, I must keep it. It's God's holy day. I've learned it's his day. And the boss said, please don't, don't leave us. We need you. Stay with us. Of course you can have the Sabbath. Anything else you'd like? <laughs> this is righteousness by faith. This is right doing by faith in Jesus Christ. He does the works. We do the believing. The pastor said, uh, when, when Mr. Whitehead came back to him, he said, I can hardly believe it. He said, I walked down the, 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 the aisle afterward. I walked down the hallway, rather, and he said, I said, Lord, I, I can't believe it. It happened so quickly. It's, it's hard to believe. I, I'm, I'm amazed. The pastor said, now let's take a promise for your home. Philippians 4.19 says, my God shall supply all your need, and you need your wife back. Now that you're a man fit to live with, you see, you see, there are a lot of men who want their wives back when they aren't even fit to live with. Now that you're fit to live with, we'll ask God to supply your need. You need her back. And they knelt down and they asked and they believed and they claimed God's promises. And Mr. Whitehead was gone. He was at quite a distance. Somebody called a pastor a couple of weeks later and they said, uh, talking to, about a church service they'd attended in another church at a distance, and they said, Mr. and Mrs. Whitehead were sitting there. The pastor said, who? Mr. and Mrs. Whitehead. His wife was with him? Yeah, well, that's what we ask. We told God we believed we could hardly believe it. 
He called Mr. Whitehead, I believe, on the phone. Tell me about it. And Mr. Whitehead said, Pastor, I claimed the promise. I asked, I believed, and I told God I'd received, and I called my wife on the phone. I said, Honey, would you be willing to come home? She said, Yes. And he said, So I want the 100 or 200 miles where we had some furniture, and, and I didn't have any time to waste, so we claimed a promise that God would supply our needs so we could sell the furniture because we couldn't move it. And we set a price on it. He said, A man came and answered the ad and insisted on paying us twice as much as we're asking. The just shall live by what? By faith. And he that is ceased from his own works, he is the one who has entered into God's rest. The next experience, my friends, is that of a man whom it was my privilege to baptize over 30 years ago. I'm going to call his name Mr. Blue because that wasn't his name. And his wife and their daughter and their son. They came to our series of meetings and were greatly enthused and inspired and found new light. They found lots of things about the Lord. The Creator's power to create a new heart. My friends, let's never forget that the Creator's work isn't just creating worlds. He's creating a whole new world of experience in human homes, in human hearts. He's creating new hearts, new spirits, new attitudes. Mr. and Mrs. Blue invited us over to their home to ask questions. Sometimes we were in their home, friends, until 10 or 10.30 at night. And their little, well, their teenage daughter, she wasn't too little, she was in her teens, she would ask more questions. And as we would study with them from God's Word, I would notice something about Mr. Blue. He couldn't listen very long. He was a hard worker, and he'd go right to sleep. And I believe that nine-tenths of the time that I was giving this study, Mr. Blue was sleeping. And I thought to myself, I I'm not going to shake him up. That would be one of the Mark of the Beast principles, you know. I'm not going to say, listen, brother, listen. No, but I prayed for him. I prayed that the Holy Spirit would take over in his life. I prayed that the righteousness of Jesus would be part of his life. I prayed a prayer of faith. Oh, we held many studies in the home. The other members were very eager and very interested, and the teenage girl would ask us questions after the others were through, and Mr. Blue would sit there nodding assent, fast asleep. When it came time for baptism, Mrs. Blue came to me with a request that I've never had before or since. She said, Pastor Kuhn, I know that my husband doesn't know very much about what we've been studying. You've seen him sitting there sleeping. She said, but I'm going to ask a special favor of you. She said, when you baptize me and our daughter and our son, would you do me a favor and baptize my husband? And I thought, what? This man whom I don't know how much he knows. She said, if you baptize my husband, I will be responsible for his soul. If that isn't a new one, if that isn't a new one. She said, but if he's not baptized when we are, I'm afraid he'll never come through. And do you know I did a lot of praying? Lord, what do you want me to do? To baptize a man? I don't know. His standing? I never do that. I like to be sure of a person standing with the Lord. And as I ask God for wisdom, he promises it. I said, Sister Blue, I'll do it. And as I said it, there were 17 butterflies in my stomach. What are you going to do? Lord, you come to my rescue. I'm just doing the best I know. I've asked you to give me wisdom. Thank you for hearing me. Mr. Blue was baptized with a family. About one year later, this information sifted back. When Mr. Blue was preparing for baptism, quote, question mark, parenthesis, he was totally involved with a young woman in his office, unbeknown to his wife, unbeknown to any member of the church, of course, unbeknown to me. As he was preparing for baptism, now notice what Jesus can do, beloved. Notice what the Holy Spirit can do. Notice the righteousness that comes by simple childlike faith. It doesn't have to be this depth of learned faith. Somebody comes and he said, 
Oh, Brother Coon, I wish I had your faith or the faith of Elijah. I, knew, I said, you know what faith Elijah had? Childlike faith. Elijah's faith wasn't Elijah's faith. It was Elijah's faith. That's the faith we need, the faith of a little child that takes God at his word. And this man, the tenth that he did here, the Holy Spirit had focused in his mind and made an impact. And he believed that he could reach up and take hold of God's power through his promises. He said to that young woman, we're through. We're completely through. She tried her charms and she tried her tears on Brother Blue, all to no avail. He cut it off. And brethren, friends, the way to see sin is don't play around with it. When you dear young people get married, don't let the devil give you one thought of the opposite sex beyond your own wife. At the first thought, cry out to God. The devil can only take possession of that heart that begins to play around with sin. He cut it off like that. He said to her, I have given my heart to Jesus Christ, and I belong to him, and he's come into my life, and I can have absolutely nothing to do with you in this relationship again. And he was true to his word. Why? How was he made righteous? By his faith in the power of Jesus Christ. This is righteousness by faith. He wasn't a super intelligent man, but he had childlike faith. Thank God for it. What do you say? May the Spirit of the living God impress every one of us at this hour to say, Lord Jesus, I'm helpless without you. I'm hopeless without you. But you've promised that it is God that works in me both to will and to do of your good pleasure. Dear Lord, at this very moment, I claim your Holy Spirit to work in the hearts of men and women who are cherishing some of these sins, O oh Lord, that will never be taken in the kingdom. And they're not happy. They get excited and thrilled, but they're not happy. Oh God, thank you for your deliverance through Jesus Christ, our Lord. We baptized them, went on our way. Several years later, my wife and I were invited to conduct a series of, of meetings at a college a few hundred miles, several hundred miles away from where the Blues lived. Their daughter, Carol, had now become a student at this college. We were looking forward to coming down to this college to see some friends and particularly to see Carol. The college gave me a room in which I could uh, conduct my consultation programs, and one of the first individuals to come into the room was Carol. Carol had been so sincere, such a beautiful Christian, that I expected to see the same, but I was disappointed. Carol did love us. She loved us as though we were her daddy and mommy or uncle and aunt. She, she said, oh, I'm so glad to see you. She said, but pastor, I just want to say one thing, so to be fair, I'm no longer a Christian. I just can't make it, and I'm not going to be a hypocrite. And you know, my friends, there are some promises. <laughs> there are promises of God's word. 1 John 5, 16, if any man see his brother or sister, sin a sin that's not unto death, he may ask, he will give him life. Does God mean it or doesn't he? Does he mean it? Amen? He means it. And I found in one of the most unlikely books that you'd expect to find it, a book entitled Medical Ministry. On page 244, these words, we should reach up to God and say, Lord, you've said ask and you'll receive I'm quoting, then to say, Lord, I must have this soul converted to you. Isn't that wonderful? Lord, I must have this soul converted to you. This soul hasn't chosen to be lost. This soul has merely become discouraged. This soul didn't understand that righteousness is by faith. The power comes by faith. I can't work my way up into obedience. It's the gift of God. So I said, in effect, Carol, don't worry a bit. I know how sincere you are. I know how sincere you were when we baptized you. You're a beautiful Christian. But she said, Pastor, I'm no longer a Christian. No, no, I'm not making any more starts. I'm not going to be a hypocrite. 
And I felt impressed to do something that I have never done before more than five times in my entire 50 years in the ministry. I said, Carol, this week you are going to find Jesus again. You see, you don't give God a time limit, but we did. I, kn I felt strongly impressed by the Holy Spirit. This was the exception to the rule. This week, I'm going to claim a promise for you. You're so sincere. You mean the best. It's just you're discouraged. She said, I, I, no, I, I can't try it again. I said, Carol, you're going to do it. I'm going to ask. I'm going to believe, and I'm going to reach right up and receive your salvation through Jesus Christ. And then she began to shake her head vigorously. And as she shook her head, you know what I did? I did the opposite. It's going to happen, Carol. You know, talk faith to people. Nod faith to people. Don't go around talking doubt. Don't say, if you straighten up and behave yourself. Humanity cannot straighten up and behave itself, but we have a Creator who can straighten us all up. Amen? Amen. So I, the more she shook her head, the more I smiled. I said, Carol, I thank the Lord. You're going to find Him this week. Yes, your heart will be completely renewed this week. And I began to think that I'd almost put a strain on her relationship. She said, Pastor, I love you and your wife very much, but listen, I'm not going to. I said, yes, you are. <laughs> you are. Now, that's exceptional. You don't always do that, you know. I said, there's one thing I'd like to have you promise me. Will you attend each one of my meetings during this spiritual emphasis week? She said, yes. She came night after night, night after night. When we made the call, she had attended. She was smart enough to get up and go out because that magnetic power of the Holy Spirit was drawing. I've often thought, you know, the way sinners will slip away from God's presence, if saints would slip away from the devil's presence, like Carol did, oh, what a victory. Thursday night, I spoke 17 minutes, not more than 17 minutes. I said, as we sing our closing song, those who want to make a new start may come forward. For, for almost 45 minutes, students were coming forward, tear-stained cheeks. They had, as they were slipping to the altar, Carolyn slipped out. Carol slipped out. Friday morning, I made another call. There were boys who had just come back from service. Big, two-story, double-chested young men came. No emotion in their faces. I saw one great big tear on, on the face of one GI. I knew what it meant. Carol slipped out. Friday night, I extended another call. As I extended the call, still others from the community came forward. Carol slipped out. Sabbath morning, as we were to close our meetings, Carol said to herself, I promised Brother Kuhn that I'd attend each meeting, but I can't stand it any longer. The Lord's going to get a hold of me, so I'm not going this morning. She went to Sabbath school, and then she went back to her dormitory room as I started speaking. She knew that I almost always closed my preaching service Sabbath morning at 12 o'clock sharp. She did want to come up and give us a final hug, and so she came over about 12 o'clock. And to the amazement of Carol, the altar call was on. People were streaming at the altar, people from the community. She started up the aisle, and a good old saint said, I'm glad you're changing your life. And that made her mad, and she went back to the dormitory. Then she said, well, they surely must be through by now. So many people were coming. We're 20 after 12. She said, I'm sure they're through now. She came back, stood in the back. The, the front was full of people. And then I saw something I have never seen before in any service I've ever conducted. I saw Carol coming up that aisle like this. It was just as though you have a rope around my neck and you're making me come. I don't want to. And you know, a text of Scripture came to my mind. Acts 5, 31. Him hath God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a savior for to give repentance. As she came clear as far as she could to the front, I said, now people, we're closing our meeting. But I said, I'm going to lift my hand and I'm going to ask God to fulfill the promise that he'll give repentance. I said, I am sure that there's somebody here right now, standing here, who came, but they have not yet repented. 
I'm going to ask God to freely shower on them the gift of repentance. And the B of prayer is what? Believe. And I'm going to believe he's doing it. The C of prayer is what? To claim it by saying, thank you, Lord, I have received. And I said, and thank you, Lord, you are giving repentance. We brought our service to a close. Went over and took lunch, went back in our guest room. An hour or so later, a little tap at the, tap at the door. We opened the door, and there was Carol. Her face was beaming. We invited her in. She said, I want to tell you, Pastor, what happened in my life. This whole week has been to me hell. She said, and then she told me the story, how she came up, and I, she said, you didn't know what was happening. She said, and I almost hated you. It looked as though you're making me come. And she said, I had no repentance whatsoever. And when she got through, I said, Carol, that's why I prayed that prayer. I said, I was watching you. Do you know, friends, Jesus is watching human lives, human faces, human hearts, hearts that have become discouraged, to whom the devil has said, there's no hope. And Jesus is hoping that we'll just say, Lord, I can't do it, but I can let you do it. She said, as you offered that prayer that God would give repentance, a tremendous change took place in my entire heart. My life belonged to Jesus. She said, it's heaven now, Pastor, it's heaven. My friends, this is not the work of a human being. This is the Holy Spirit's work. First, God had given her daddy righteousness by faith. Now we win souls by faith. And God imparts his righteousness in other souls. Dear Lord, I must have this soul converted to you. What about your heart? Can you say, Lord, I'm not going to try a do-it-yourself religious program anymore. I'm going to let Jesus do the work in my heart. Dear Lord, there are many hearts that are trembling who have been overcome for, for many years. And dear Lord, the devil has said there's no hope. Oh, Lord, thank you. Jesus Christ is our hope. Spirit of the living God, help them to be able to make a commitment to the Lord to do the work right now. Thank you for hearing. In Jesus' name, amen. And may God bless you. And now for our questions and answers, but first let us seek the Lord. Dear Lord, down through the ages you've always come to the rescue of your people. And we know, dear Lord, that there are many bleeding hearts, broken homes, souls that are in great distress. But thank you that you've said, call unto me in your day of trouble. I will deliver you, and you'll glorify me. So we believe your promise, and thank you for hearing us as we consult together in Jesus' name. Amen. The first question says, my son is 29 years old. He's never been married, nor held down a job. He lives in Hawaii, and I think he grows and sells marijuana. I love him, and I've always supported him when he has been in financial need. But now I'm beginning to think I've been wrong. And I told him that unless he gets a job and a permanent address by the time he's 30, he could forget about getting any more money from me. I even threatened to change my will and exclude him from it. I think I'm right, but I'm asking to make sure. Uh, you may be right, but I hope you haven't suggested it to him this way. You see, it sounds as though you're angry with him. You are disappointed. You are heartbroken. The Lord understands. You are right in the discipline of love. Hebrews 12, 6. God says, whatever a man sows, he'll reap. And there's no question but what, as long as a person keeps supporting an individual in idleness and in wrong habits, he is actually uh, holding back the natural discipline of this man's doings. But wouldn't it be nicer, and maybe you have handled it this way, wouldn't it be nicer to tell him how you're praying for him? Wouldn't it be better to use the law of faith and say, I believe God's going to give you deliverance? And my reason for not further supporting you is that 
I'm not accomplishing what I want to anyway. And this is only supporting you in this idleness. And, and, and God cannot bless me because I'm responsible. I'm a steward of his money. And as a steward of his money, I must be conscientious. And it's the only thing I know to do as far as my responsibility to the Lord is concerned. Thus, you will realize that the way that you're traveling is not the right way. And thus, you may come to a realization of the fact that there is a better way, and you'll reach out to this better way. Now, I've almost preached it. So you'll be careful not to preach at him over this. But what I'm saying, you'll try to explain this to him from the angle of love, deep love, your stewardship to God, and uh, without looking down at him, you see, this is very difficult. It's difficult. It's an art. But God bless you. Yes, the Lord definitely says that a man must sow what he reaps until he learns to sow different seed. The next questioner says, what should a wife do if she discovers her husband is a homosexual? There are several choices. Number one, first of all, you'd claim a promise from the Lord. Like James 1, 5, or Psalm 25, 9, or Psalm 32, 8, or Isaiah 42, 16, which says, I'll bring the blind by a way that they knew not. I will lead them in paths they've not known. And as you claim the promise, this is very important, the next step. We have been teaching for many years the ABCs of prayer. For I picked up the ABCs of prayer and the way we're now presenting them in a deep Gethsemane experience. And I learned that the A of prayer means I'm asking, but my asking, the philosophy of my asking means this, Lord, I don't know how to solve this problem. That's the meaning of ask. The B of prayer is to believe, Mark 11, 24. And when I tell the Lord I believe, it means that I will come into a trusting relationship with the Lord. Lord, the thing that I cannot possibly regulate, the thing that I cannot possibly solve, I will trust you to solve. The C of prayer, which is to receive or claim by thanking God we've received, Matthew 21, 22, <clears throat> and John 11, 41, <clears throat> Now, this philosophy of the sea is saying, Lord, you're the creator. The gift is in the promise. Therefore, Lord, I'm going to keep saying to you, you are showing me the way. You are giving me the wisdom. I am receiving it because you cannot lie. Keep telling him this as you go along about your housework. Whatever you're doing, let your voice continually ascend to the Lord. Maybe several times through the day, Lord, you are giving me wisdom. I don't want to run ahead of you, Lord. You're giving me the wisdom. Now, having taken this step, the third step is this. He says, I will bring the blind <clears throat> by a way that they knew not. Always leave God the latitude of working a miracle in a way we don't expect. This has been one of the hardest lessons for me to learn and one of the hardest lessons for other Christians we seem to feel like uh, we are mapping out the only possible choices for the Lord, see? But remember, after we've mapped out all the options, all the possible solutions, the Lord has a thousand left by which he can work the recovery. Now, number four would be this. As you're claiming God's wisdom, you will ask the Lord to help you to figure out the different options that you have. What are the different choices? If you absolutely know him to be a homosexual, what are the choices? Number one would be to pray for him alone. Number two would be to have a prayer group, according to Matthew 18, 19. You don't have to tell the group of ladies about your husband. You just tell them that there's an unspoken request, see? And now two or three are praying. Then number three, you'll ask the Lord to help you to be so attractive spiritually that the Lord can get through to him through you. For instance, if he sees that you're a trusting soul, that you trust God's forgiveness and cleansing in your own life, it will give him a format on which he can work, you see. But if he sees nothing in you except a restlessness, 
where can he find any format of peace? So you'll present to him, because you'll go to the Lord to find this peace, you'll present to him a peace, a trusting, a happy, not necessarily a bubbling over attitude, but a simple trusting attitude in the Lord. Now, the next point is this. You'll ask God to keep you from belittling him. All belittling can drive the person farther into the habit. Jesus says, esteeming other better than ourselves. He spoke this by the Holy Spirit through the Apostle Paul, Philippians 2, 3. And then we find in 1 Peter 2, 17, honor all men. Now, we honor this individual because Jesus honored him to such an extent that had not another soul in all the world accepted Christ, Jesus would have died for that homosexual. He'd have shed his blood on Calvary for that homosexual. See, this is how, how very precious this soul is to Jesus. Therefore, we cannot pass this by lightly, superficially, you see. Now, if after all this has been accomplished in your life and through your prayers, nothing happens, and he completely rejects God, which is possible, then you have a perfect right and perhaps a responsibility to take the next step of separation. And also, you have a right to divorce. The Bible says that we are to love our neighbors as ourselves, but how can one love themselves when they see so much wrong with themselves? On the same basis of which, of which uh, I mentioned in a question a moment ago, you see, Jesus has put the price on me. It's not for me to estimate my value. Christ has already done that. And not merely has he done that, but in 1 John 3, 1 to 3, he says, listen to this, behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called sons and daughters of God, children of God. This means that you are a prince or a princess. Jesus says so. His word declares it. His word confirms it. A princess has no right belittling oneself. You are God's child. I am God's child. Think of this and tell him, I'm your child, Lord. You may have heard me tell the experience of a young woman, perhaps she was around 20, who evidently was in the same situation as you are. And she was telling us how unworthy, how inferior she feels, and how she's lost all of her self-image of respect. And we quoted to her this wonderful statement from 1 John 3, 1 to 3. You're God's child. You don't have to pull down A's in every study in order to respect yourself, you see. You don't have to be the prettiest girl in the country to respect yourself. You're a, you are to respect yourself on the basis of your worth, as Jesus has indicated it by his blood that was shed on Calvary. The next questioner writes, my brother-in-law is a crook and a church member. Even my wife admits that he's a scoundrel. He has cost me nearly $12,000 by his crooked dealings, and he has built other church members to say nothing of the non-Christians he has cheated. I have the evidence against him, and he needs to learn a lesson. We have talked to him one-to-one, -one, and I even took the pastor with me but he refuses to repent and make good on his responsibility. There is only one course left, and that is to take him to court. Though he is a church member, he is not a Christian, and I don't think the Bible instruction about Christians suing Christians apply. Am I right? No. <laughs> no. <clears throat> Paul was speaking to the people at Corinth. Do you remember what kind of people they were? And he's talking about church members airing their problems before the world. And this is exactly what he's saying. You have every right in the world to ask your pastor to, to do what the Bible says. First, you've already gone to this man, evidently. You've probably taken a couple with you. But don't forget, beloved, this. As you take these steps, if he sees a venom in your life, rather than the attitude of Jesus toward those who crucified him, this itself could preclude his repentance. If he sees a love, in spite of all the injuries you've received, if he sees the love of Jesus, 
you see. This will go a long way. Discipline, yes. Anger, hatred, malice, no. You could actually be as bad in the attitude that you take in the response as he has bad, been bad, see. This is Christianity for us. And friends, I'm telling you right now that none of us is able to represent this attitude of Jesus Christ except as he dwells in us. So we need to reach right up and claim his promises. This is how to represent him. Uh, first, uh, second uh, Peter 1, 4 says, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these we might be partakers of the divine nature. See, Peter's talking to people. We human beings, ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that's in the world through lust. Discipline is most essential. Anger, frustration, no. And if you have expressed anger, ask him to forgive you. But you can still go right ahead with the discipline. But once more, may I caution, 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 any of your friends and loved ones who deal with him in this church trial, they should be extremely cautious to represent a love. We're told in Romans 2, 6, and 8 that it's the goodness of God that leads men to repentance, see? So just a church trial won't lead him to repentance. He needs to see that we love him, and the reason for this church discipline is to help him to realize that he cannot possibly make his way to the kingdom under this kind of a program. I have a wife <clears throat> who was molested by her father when she was a child. He threatened to kill her if she ever reported him. Now she has turned against all men, myself included. I love her deeply, but she says I and all men remind her of her father. Now what can I do? First of all, it's very important that we'll find some promises of God's word like the ones found in Jeremiah chapter 32, 17 and 27. There's nothing too hard for the Lord nothing too hard for the Lord. Humanly speaking, this is absolutely hopeless or nearly hopeless, let's face it. Humanly speaking, it would require at the best years of careful counseling and guidance. But aren't you glad that we have a creator who made this world in one week? And he said, he looked out upon the world and it was without form and void and darkness was on the face of the deep. And what did God say? Let there be light. What happened? <coughs> light came, just like that. So our creator can change things instantly. Look at, uh, look at Lazarus, who had been dead four years, uh, four days, <laughs> pardon me. And, and there Jesus came before that tomb and all these people were mourning and many of them were hired mourners. They knew there was no hope for that man. Uh, decomposition had set in. Jesus said, Lazarus, come forth. So reach out to the Lord. That's number one. Number two, ask God to help you to be very, very patient because loving kindness is the thing that'll draw her. Jeremiah 31, verse 3. The Lord has appeared of old unto me, saying, Yea, I've loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness have I drawn you. Let me give you an example of what outstanding love and kindness can do to, this, to a soul who's so frustrated. We're holding a series of meetings up in the North Midwest. And one of the elders of our church came to me and related this experience. He said he had a relative, I think it was a sister, who was so frustrated that she was practically losing her mind, next thing to a loss of mind. He said that <clears throat> she was down in the area of, the, of Tennessee and some dear Christian people took her into their home as, as though she were a daughter. She would carry on at night so that she wouldn't arise and tear everything to pieces she asked them to put a sheet around her and to actually pin it up with safety pins all the way up. They had awakened in the middle of the night and this girl, somehow or another, with her arms bound, 
somehow or another, she wiggled out of that sheet. It, it, was, it was about her so tightly you wouldn't believe it was possible. This happened night after night, and the only way they were sure that she wouldn't destroy herself was this. But during all of this time, there was a motherly love that was amazing indeed. One evening, when this dear mother in Israel was again putting this sheet around her, just as she was about to do it, this girl reaches up and slaps her slam bang on the cheek. And this precious mother in Israel looks down into her face and she said, Honey, I know how you feel. If it would help you to feel a little better, be free to slap me on the other cheek. The Lord used that beautiful attitude as healing on this girl. That girl was healed in a matter of days. She is now out helping other people to find Jesus. Isn't it wonderful, the healing balm of the love of Jesus Christ? Next yeah. question. While I was in the hospital, my husband bought our children a dog, and they have become very attached to it. I don't like dogs or any kind of animals, and my husband knows it. I am very angry that he took advantage of the situation of my absence. Now what am I to do? I will not have this beast in my home and tearing up my yard. I have told my husband he must get rid of the dog, but he only argues with me and says that I am unreasonable. I am not. This is my home, not a dog house, and I know that I am right in this situation. I do not believe that I should have to do away with the dog. It is my husband's responsibility to me. What can be done to get him to accept his responsibility to my wishes? That's a good question, and friend, not merely that. You have no idea how much I sympathize with you. I belong to a family of dog-hating coons. My mother and my father would no more let a dog in our house. If somehow a dog came into our house and lay down on the couch, that dog would be a hot dog <laughs> inside of an hour, so to speak. And they were so opposed to dogs that they reared their children with the same dogged attitude toward dogs. All five brothers of us who were preachers, every one of us, I believe without exception for years, preached, beware of dogs. <laughs> and we really gave it the works. Then one day, then one day, praise the Lord how good he is, I went to visit a man who had just lost his wife. And I went to bring him some comfort, and there was a little toy Pomeranian doggy. <laughs> and that little doggy had no idea the coon feelings that were in my heart against dogs. She reached up, you know, and she, in her little dog language, she's saying, you're the most wonderful person in all the world. And I thought, she just, if she only knew. And the man said, and so I reached down and kind of patted her a little bit, and patted her a wee bit. And I told my daughter, who liked dogs, and would pick up any old scroungy dog, I said, if you leave these ugly dogs long, alone. If I ever find a, a halfway decent dog, I'll bring it to you. And so I petted this dog a little bit, and the man said, would you like to give this dog a home? And I thought, oh my. In the first place, I couldn't afford it. He said, look, I can't keep this dog. I'd like to have it have a good home. And when he said a good home, it was like italics. Could I ever give a dog a good home? I said, thank you. I took the dog home. My children were out to school. My wife was out shopping. I petted that little dog and fell in love with dogs, and I have ever since. Now, this isn't the whole story. This is just to let you know we sympathize with you. But the second point is, the God who could change my heart toward dogs can change your heart. But that's not the story. Number three is this. God has given us a command, and the command is very clear, and it's very final. And it's in 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 1 to 7. It says that there is a chain of command in the household. And, and my dear, dear friend, God has presented this chain of command. Man didn't invent it. God has commanded it. And in his command, and you'll find it again and again and again in the Word of God, unequivocally presented in his Word. It says the husband is the head. You ask God to give you the grace to be the woman that 1 Peter 3, 1 to 7 says to be. 
You ask God to help you be wholesome and sweet and kind. This is the way you can save your whole household. You see? It's true. Your husband didn't do right, as far as we can see from your statement. He should have consulted you, without a doubt. But it's done now. The dog is there. The children have fallen in love with this dog. You start taking over, and the children will blame you. And there'll be disharmony. And they'll always feel that you're more to blame than, your, than, than their daddy. And their, their loyalties are pulled apart, you see. So ask God to help you to be the wife that the Bible has told you to be, and God will reward you. My husband has at least three girls, that is, girlfriends. He tells me if I were like them, he would stay home. Shall I try to be like them? No, no. You shall not try to be like them. Because if you were like them, you'd be having a boyfriend on the side. No, don't try to be like them. Try to be like Jesus. Now, what was Jesus like? We have a twofold phase of the life and character and ministry of Jesus. We have the passive phase and we have the active phase. The passive phase, he was kind and loving and long-suffering to the repentant sinner. But he had a, he had a, little, a little scourge for those that were defiling the temple of God. Now, he, he wasn't showing human hatred, though. But there is the essence, there is the element of, of discipline that is needed. Now, how are you going about it? First of all, in Song of Solomon, chapter 5, verse 16, it says of Jesus, His mouth is most sweet, yea, he's altogether lovely. Ask God to help you. Maybe you'll block out six weeks of time. And you say, Lord, help me during these six weeks. Because if you think in terms of a year or two or three years, you can't do it. Lord, help me day by day, day by day, for a period, let's say, of six weeks, to so grow into my relationship with Jesus Christ that I will be the sweetest sweetheart to my husband that he's ever known. If I have been belittling him, Lord, give me victory over it. For we found that in most cases, not all, in most cases where a man goes and picks up other girls, he doesn't feel at ease in his wife's presence. It's true of the opposite sex also. And we find that usually the reason why he doesn't feel at ease is because the true faithful mate has done two things. Either tried to schedule him, teach him, educate him, pick on him, or belittle him, or both. Ask God if in any way, of course, you naturally would belittle him, belittle him if you saw him and knew he was doing this. Ask God to keep you from any belittling, for me, any kind of pressure to be the sweetest wife, according to 1 Peter 3, 1 to 7, then after this period of time is, is taken, if there's no change then in him, then you face it head on if God gives you this, this wisdom, which I believe he will. And you'll say to him, you cannot have, you cannot have any other woman except me. And carry through. But watch, here's something that's very important. When this discipline starts, don't give up and throw up your hands and say it's all over. When the discipline comes, he may have learned his lesson. This is happening thousands of times across America and other lands. When the discipline comes, he realizes what he's losing, and he can be converted. So don't give up. So that God will bless the dear ones who've requested this help, shall we pray. Dear Lord in heaven, it is not in man that walketh to direct his steps. We cannot possibly live up to these beautiful principles of your word in ourselves. But you've said it is God that worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure, Philippians 2.13. We reach up asking you to come to the rescue of these dear ones. We believe you're doing it, and thank you for hearing us in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, and God bless you.